Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. Uh, we've all worked for all the major publishers in the business. Together, we've published somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art programs. That is right. Each week we come to you guys with different listener questions or fantastic interviews with illustrators. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you learn something brand spanking new. Brand spanking new. And we're not going to bury the lead today. We're talking about art schools. We're talking about uh, uh, upper education and art, how to go about it, what pitfalls to avoid, questions to ask yourself to know that you're ready and whatnot. Um, and this all comes from us talking to uh, an art student recently, uh, the three of us, and just kind of answering some of his questions and uh, giving him advice and and really uh, uh, like digging in deep to see where uh, students are at at this time doing art classes at not just art schools, but like schools that teach art, even if they're not an art school themselves. But uh, I wanted to... Uh, we wanted to just get into it and, and talk about it uh, on this episode. So let's let's just dive right in. Lee, I think you did. You want to go first, and then we'll do I, Will. I do because this is a this is a a, a big kind of lead in question. I think it might be good. Um, you know, a lot of my friends have kids that are in high school, different different levels. You know, junior, senior, whatever. And I'm starting to get the emails from them. Hey, my son or daughter is interested in art. What do you think of this school? What do you think of that? And it's just an interesting conversation to have. It's a, it's a tough one to have actually, depending on who this, who the person is and where they are and fi mm -hmm. financially where they are all the, you know, there's so many circumstances, but I thought it would be interesting to ask you guys, if mm -hmm. you were right now a junior in high school or a senior maybe, but a junior is the perfect place to start asking this. Um, and you're interested in becoming an illustrator, what would your path be personally? Not like what you recommend for everybody, but you mm. personally, what would you do? Yeah, I would, I would probably, uh, uh, want some sort of, I'd probably need some sort of framework that a formal education would provide at least for a couple of years where I know that I have to show up on time. I have to deliver a project by a certain time. I, I receive some hands-on instruction, but I would absolutely be supplementing that with all of the available resources online. And I would, whatever kind of uh, budget that I have towards education, part of that would be going to, um, SVS Learn to Schoolism to uh, New Masters Academy to CGA MA right to to Nomen right mm -hmm. any one of these classes that would kind of show me here's how you uh, here's how you do the fundamentals here's how you do uh, very specific techniques that you need to be professional um, but going backwards first I would also be really smart and this is a hard thing because when you're 18 19 you don't know exactly what path you need to follow yet you there's a lot of experimentation you don't know what right. is available to you and so i think that's why you kind of do that and feel what what really works for you but once you know oh i really liked doing concept art or i really liked doing you know animation or whatever it was or children's books go and see where those jobs are see who's getting those jobs, see what the qualifications are, and then backtrack. Like, what do I need to be able to do that exact thing? Right. Mm. But you will. In in this fantasy, am I wealthy? Am I coming from wealthy parents? You're just just normal. No, you're you're not you're not Bill Gates' son. I was never normal. So that's out that's off the table. Let's just say you're middle class, regular middle class. Man, you know, I don't like these kinds of questions because you know, I know what I know now, and you can't know the things that I you know don't now know. When, right. you're, when you're 18. Um, well, here's well, no, the thing. but I'm asking it with knowing the stuff that you know now, not not trying to project yeah. your naivete from when you were 18. Like, I, I'm, Will I'm Terry wakes up, he's 18 again. Right. <laughs> but he doesn't have any abilities. He has nothing. Right. Do, I have, do I have arms you, and you've legs? Got, you've got the knowledge. <laughs> you just have the knowledge. 
Okay. But you don't have the ability. So, yeah, I, I, I'm tempted, like self-serving, I would say, hey, go to SVS where you can get where all of your wildest dreams can come true, you know, and you can learn everything, right? Um, I, I was the kind of student who didn't know much about anything <laughs> as far like i wanted to make art for a career mm-hmm. i knew that i was good at making art i was better at making art than anything else anything else that i and, and any other job that i thought of made me want to cry so that's all i wanted to do right right and i got lucky in that i went to our church school which was byu which has an amazing illustration program most universities don't right that's true I There's got an lucky. exceptional illustration program there. Right. And, and especially at that time, it was really, really good. Hmm. Um, I got lucky in that I just happened to go there and I saw what the fine artists were doing and I wasn't really interested in that. And then I saw the what the uh, design college was doing, which held illustration. And I was like, that's exactly what I want to do. So, and the reason why I'm putting this in there is because some p- kids, you know, they live at home and they they don't have money to go to a out of state school and their parents are like, you know, you can go to the state college. And so if I sit here and I go, you know, I would go to, to a four year art program and stuff. There are so many students that we've met that have said to us after finding SVS, they're like, I've learned more in a few of your classes than I did in four years in my art program. Right. Cause a lot of art programs don't really teach, um, good drawing fundamentals. They don't value, you know, structural, you know, color theory. And I mean, they're really like paint your feelings to be, to be Mm -hmm. really basic. Right. It's, it's more like, you know, well, what do you feel and stuff? And there's, right. There, there's value in that as well. I'm not diminishing that, that, that um, philosophy is valuable, but it needs to be uh, coupled with the structure. Right. And, and, Man, there, I could talk for this on this for so long because so many schools, they'll have really good teachers and they'll have like, let's say they have a few teachers who who are good at teaching structure and teaching good good drawing fundamentals and good design principles and stuff like that. Well, then, you know, like I've, I've seen students that are like, hey, should I should I come to your school? You know, this is when I was teaching at UVU. I'm like, yeah. And then the, the main teachers, uh, one of them gets transferred Another one goes on sabbatical right when this, these kids come in and they end up with a couple of adjuncts that are the worst hires I've ever seen. And, you know, and they're like, what the heck, you know, is going on? Yeah. And they, they're getting Bait a totally switch. different experience than other students. So that's one thing that can happen. Um, and then the, so I, I think I was the kind of student. I can't really go into your fantasy league. I, I needed the structure. I needed the four year experience. I didn't know I needed to talk to the other students to find out. Now I'm not growing up. I have no idea what it's like to grow up now when you can talk to people on discord and you can talk to people on Instagram and, you know, all the social media outlets. And I feel like kids uh, knowledge base is much higher than it was when I went into school. Like I had to find out, I didn't even know what it was, what anything of what it was like to be an illustrator going to school. And I feel like there's a lot of people online that never went to a four year degree that know a heck of a lot more than I did Mm -hmm. when I came out of that four year degree program. So I I think, I think that's true in everything. I mean, like I watched some of the YouTube stuff, you know, coming from a skateboarding background, I used to have to look at the magazines, skateboard magazines, and there'd be a picture of somebody in the air and I'd have to try to figure out what they did to get in that position. You know what I mean? You have no, <laughs> no idea. Right. Nobody telling you. Now you, right. I saw a kid the other day who's like six years old, who's doing, you know, seven twenties, which was a big deal yeah. when I was younger. You know, it was a huge deal when Tony Hawk did that. Right. And, and so, you know, everybody's got sort of the benefit of that. But I mean, I think, you know, fast forwarding to what I understand you know, it might be a little bit different. Um, uh, if I was young right now, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to kind of put yourself back there and think, okay, I've got the same, uh, information and knowledge that I already have now, but now I'm 18. Like I woke up and I'm 18. I I know everything. I, I would probably, um, a la carte, I would use the, basically the buffet model. I would do Mm -hmm. SVS. I would have to have some kind of structure. So I would probably every other term, 
maybe go to like a regular school or something. Mm-hmm. Cause I don't, I, I think it's impossible to do it by yourself in your room. I mean, I think it's the rare person yeah. who can do that. Right. I needed to see other students killing it. Right. Like the ones that I looked right. up to, to go, Holy cow. Right. I, I need learned to more step f- up. I learned more from the students at art center the teachers were, I'm going to say this, there were some crappy teachers there. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't teach at all. Basically, they're like, yeah. look at how good everybody is around you. Now you'd be that good too. Right. <laughs> I mean, that was, their, right. that was their teaching philosophy. Um, and they didn't, uh, I remember there was one teacher, we would get to class and we would just like, he just opened up a magazine. I'm not kidding. Like juxtapose magazine. And we, he'd just flip through. We're all around him in a circle and he'd be like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I was in that class, but it was a drawing class, Lee. And we had a teacher that would go, he would grunt. He would look at, like, he'd pull out really good um, prints of sketches from old masters and stuff. And he and the, the grad students would, would go, mm. Mm. you know, like, no, see this, look at, look at this line right here. Um, but if you, if you think about the a la carte method right now, I mean, you could, you could take a class from Nathan folks. You could take a class from us. You could mm-hmm. take a, and then, and then you could go to your community college or, or maybe your local state college that is affordable. Take some, take some structured drawing classes. The problem is like Will said, it's, it's a crapshoot on who you're going to get. And that's what that's I would true. always recommend to students now is don't follow the school, follow the people. And yeah. so find the teachers that are doing work that you're like, wow, that's really good. Every other term when I was at Art Center, um, or not every other term, every third term, I would take a break and I would go study at the Art Institute or uh, the um, Associates in Art, which was the figure drawing specific school in Los Angeles. It's kind of mm-hmm. like what the figure of the academy what is it? The figure, figurative academy or whatever it is now. All those teachers, Charles Hugh and Steve Houston and Kevin Chin and all those guys were uh, teaching over at, at Associates in Art. And so every like third term, I had enough of the fine art stuff at Art Center and I would go back and I would learn more structure, take a perspective class from Alex Gross, like all these people. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just like so many different options. And so I was already starting to do that even back then. But man, with so much, and this was my advice to my, my, uh, my friend about her daughter getting ready to be an artist and graduate high school it's like there's just so many options how could you possibly settle on one that costs 150 to 200 thousand dollars um and then you're then you're stuck with that little group of teachers where you have a worldwide you know a la carte Mm -hmm. you got the worldwide buffet you can choose Mm -hmm. from who you want to there's a watercolorist i'm following um who's starting a class soon on Instagram, who's maybe one of the best watercolors I've ever seen in my life. I think I'm going to take the class. Um, and it's just online, you know, he's doing lessons and all that stuff and he's mm-hmm. incredible. So. And I mean, so, that, and you, you've do. learned so much and what you're saying is you want to learn even more. Oh yeah. I mean, I just, just, I mean, like Jake and I were talking about it earlier. Like there's a certain, there's a certain amount of information in your own head and it can mm-hmm. never be enough. Like Jake's, uh, my example to Jake was he's, you know, he's got, he does a lot of robots and stuff like that. He probably has a, maybe a joint or two, like for the knee joint, like here's mm-hmm. how a, a, a robot moves and the, mm-hmm. the joint that you use, but there's probably, you know, a hundred other options that if you take a class on robotics or whatever you're interested mm-hmm. in, you all of a sudden broaden what that, what that look is. And for me, I like, you know, you, I tend to use a certain palette. I might use a certain composition and you, after a certain number of years of doing this professionally, you might not even know that you've settled in to this right. thing and you just want somebody to knock you out of that a little bit. And it has to be, you know, I look at these people and I ask myself, can I do what they're doing? And the answer is 100% no, mm. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so that means mm-hmm. that there's a lot more to learn. You know, I was listening to, um, David Goggins on the Rogan podcast a few years ago and one of the, you know, he's a Navy SEAL, right? He's like, yeah. he's like a crazy. Athlete. Yeah. He's a nut. And right. he said, um, his whole thing is, is you got to fill a sketchbook while running a marathon <laughs> every day. <laughs> <laughs> he says, he says, um, when you are, are, um, in a survival situation, when you're, you know, you're, you're forced to, uh, swim further, walk further, um, hike further, whatever it is. And you're just dead, right? Mm -hmm. You're beat and you feel like you can't go anymore. 
He said the human body can go 60% more. You're not even halfway when you, right, you when, haven't if you, touched it. If you've ever been in a situation where you're like, you're trying to get back to the car from a long hike and you're like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I can't believe it. That I, I can't, I'm, I don't know if I'll make it or not. You got 60% more in you. you it's, your, it's your mind holding you back, right? Mm-hmm. And so one of the, one of the messages I want um, art students, you know, who are maybe listening to this and thinking about going to school. If you're, if you go to your school and you're, one of the best in your school mm-hmm. you're in the wrong place you right. you're not you're not in a place that's going to help you that much um and and you need to be around people that are better than you to, that will that will show you uh that you can achieve a lot more than you already are because when you're the when you're the big fish in the small pond the tendency is to feel like you got it you know you're 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 doing great and you can kind of relax and you can't in this business, in, you know, in, in, in going into any kind of illustration career, um, mm-hmm. you can't afford to be not one of the best. It's, it's that competitive when you get out and, um, and those, those students that are better than you will show you um, how much more dedication you need to have to your craft. So you need to you need to you need to get a different group of people that are that you're hanging around with either online or in your pro, in a different program that will um, that will mentor you. And they don't know you're, they're mentoring you, but they are, you know, especially if you're paying attention. Let me ask you guys a question. How if you yeah. were to if you didn't want to go the route that you're talking about where you're at a at a formal kind of training ground and you're setting yourself up around people who are better than you. If you're just like, I'm going to do the a la carte method. I'm going to do the online method. How do you stop yourself from the American idol scenario that I've talked about many times on this podcast, where you think you're good and you're not, mm-hmm. and you don't mm-hmm. know. Mm. Yeah. I honestly, that that's, that's difficult. Uh, if you're, if you don't have access to, uh, a professional who has an eye who's willing to give you an honest an honest critique and you can go and ask it's you can email uh, or dm a hundred different pr- professionals yeah, but do you think they ever tell the truth i mean it's not it's it's few and far between who will tell somebody i don't think you're ready or i don't know if what i'm looking at has potential you're going to have to keep going I and think show if, me in a year if if it's a true professional and you say you can hurt my feelings or you can't, you know, I'm giving you permission right, right, right. to give me the, the, the honest truth. I think you'll get it. I'll, you'll get it from someone, you know, and if you ask, am I ready for, for the big leagues? The, here's the thing though. If you're ready for the big leagues, you're already getting people reaching out to you and DMing you and saying, Hey, can you, uh, can you do this for me? Are you available for this? You know, we saw your work and you're on our short list of people that we want for this one project. You start getting four or five of those. Like I have a, a student, not a student. She's, she graduated. She was my assistant, uh, for a while. And she just, uh, texted me the other day and she's like, Hey, I need help finding an agent. I've had three editors reach out to me saying, we really like the work you're doing and we want to see if you're available to do a children's book or, or, you know, if you have any ideas, she doesn't need any more validation than that. Right. <laughs> That's a pretty good indicator. Yeah. You know, and if, if you, we, we've talked about this before too, but if you really want to know where you stack up, um, you know, I, I remember being in school and thinking my work was really good, but I was comparing it to my classmates, you know, I mean, I really was looking around and going, well, I'm definitely in the top half of, this was when I was a senior. Um, and, you know, kind of what we've come up with, what, what's kind of been going around on the internet is, is take your work and put it in a nine grid of other professionals work and see if it stacks up, if you can't see it, ask, ask three random people, you know, which is your favorite piece on this nine grid. And if none Mm -hmm. of them ever pick you, 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 you know, you're probably not good enough or ask them even more harsh, ask them, which is the worst of this, of these nine, you know, Mm -hmm. scares me. (laughs) So Um, what, what was, 
was uh, the question you you came up with, Will, prior prior to this meeting? Oh well, I have like I didn't really come up with a question, but I have um, or a topic. I, I have um, ten sins that mm -hmm. that uh, art students commit that okay. the worst art, art students commit, and and maybe you you know you could you uh, commit some of them. Then I have some things that you should do as an art student. Do you want to read all 10 and then we comment or do you want to read each one and we sort of can, let's just go one at a time. And we, and if you guys want to throw in okay. the first one is chronically late to class. Okay. Right, what, yeah. What's the problem with that? I mean, I yeah, know what, what is it is, problem? but I'm asking you, why, why is that your number one thing? Well, as a teacher who, who um, like I didn't just show up and go, okay, guys, get out your work and just start working. I mean, that was rare. I usually prepared a lecture mm -hmm. for the first 20 to 30 minutes of class to give that, give the students, um, you know, uh, principles and things to think about and as they're working and mm -hmm. um, examples and stuff. And, and um, they would come in and miss half or all of my, my, uh, what I thought were gems that I was giving to them. Now, if you have a teacher that's, not doing anything, maybe that's not that big of a deal. But I think that there's, I think there's something also for yourself. I, I've heard it said that being chronically late is the ultimate form of narcissism because, mm. you know, you're saying that your time is more valuable than anybody else's and mm. your disruption coming in doesn't matter to anybody. Like you, you, you're not self-aware enough to even see that that is a distraction to the rest of the group and that there's something um, something to be gained by having the discipline to get yourself physically to the place you're supposed to be on time. Um, and I think that that, that translates through a lot of the different areas of your life too. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, sin number two, sin number two is, uh, um, yeah, let me, let me add to that oh, sin ahead. just for a second, because it, what you're saying is it's a, it's sort of a symptom of a bigger problem. Right. When they when they're when they're acting that way, right. the thing that I would see a lot of times with students is they would, and, you know, this was at the Art Institute of Portland where it was really expensive to be a student there, and then they would <clears throat> they'd pay all this money for the for tuition, and then they would not make it to class because they couldn't buy the bus fare or they lost their <laughs> bus pass or some other little thing like that, and so watch out for big money versus small money. If you're spending big money for a school you got to make sure the small money is there like to get on a bus and, and, <laughs> right. and go across town. Um, and so it's just all these little kind of things that Will's talking about. It's not just being late to class. It's all the excuses that go with it. Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't buy any paint for today. You yeah. know, and when you're going to be yeah. in class, I saw that a ton of times. I didn't get the right materials. Oh, I didn't know we were doing that. And then because they're late, they miss half the thing. And then you have to give, they miss half the lecture and you have to give them kind of a private lecture to get them back up to speed. It's just super uh, annoying as an instructor. And I don't know a lot of people who would kind of put up with it, but just watch out if you're one of those people that always has the thing, Oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. I didn't get this. And and, and all these excuses kind of start adding up. Yep. Okay. okay so number two is you tell your teacher that you're going to do amazing work this semester. And that is, it doesn't it, on face value, it probably doesn't sound like that big of a sin, but what it, what's happening there is that the student has always failed before and mm -hmm. they're trying to talk themselves into uh, being good this time, right? And I've yeah. had that happen every single year I've taught. Someone that comes up to me and goes, I am so excited for this class. I'm going to do amazing work. I'm going to do, and, and they never do. They're the worst person in the class. They're the ones that don't turn in work, that are late, that are missing, MIA. Mm -hmm. The and work like, needs to speak for itself. And they, they have a hard time looking you in the eye the rest of the semester. It was almost like they're going, what they really want to say is, look, I've sucked in every other class and I don't want to this time. So mm -hmm. I hope I don't. That's what they're really saying. <laughs> what it comes out <laughs> is I'm going to do amazing work this semester and you're going to just be so proud of me. Um, and uh, anyway, that's in number two. So, so you're saying there that the over delivering promise is the problem. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm it's, just, I'm it's, just trying it's to basically what a the psychological thing, 
thing that happens with students that just, I mean, it's just like, it's happened every year that I've taught every semester where I'm like, you're the one who, and as soon as they say it, I'm like, I, I wish I could tell them right then and there. Like, oh, I'm so sad for you. <laughs> That's an interesting, it's an interesting thing because what you're really, I mean, what they're saying is I'm super excited about this term. Um, feel like I'm ready to right. deliver some, some kind of thing. And you're saying that that's an indicator of somebody who's not going to do that. So do right. you ever, does it, do they ever prove you wrong where you're all of a sudden like, Oh, they, they're turning in great work. Never. Not once. That's why I put it on the list. Never once. I have a side version of that too. It's a, it, it always happens at the beginning of a term and you got to watch this too, by the way, if you're, if you're a la carding in education and mm -hmm. that is what, you know, I'll see a, a familiar face, a student I've had in a class before. I say, oh, how's this term going to go? And they're so excited. And they're like, I'm taking, I'm taking eight classes and I'm working <laughs> full time. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh man, you better pick your top two because that's the only two that are going to get any attention. The rest of them you're going to barely pass if you pass. And so, right. you know, that I mean, they, they just get too big of an appetite. And there's just no way to, to do that much. Um, and it's easy to do because when you're looking at class descriptions, you do get excited. Oh, that'd be fun. Oh, that'd be great. But you don't think about each class taking, you know, each class. I would say to do a class well, you have to spend five hours a week minimum mm -hmm. on that particular class. Well, you mm -hmm. know, you get four classes. Now you're at 20 hours. That doesn't include work. That doesn't include tra travel and all that, right. you know, back and forth. So you just got to be really careful. And then some classes are going to be more than the five hours to get through them. But like our children's book pro class right now, it could be five hours just to listen to the lectures that we're right. doing because mm -hmm. we have so much information. And then, so now you got another five hours to do the work. So that's 10 hours. Right. So just got, just got to watch out that you don't fill your plate too much. Yep. I'd, I'd rather my advice is take less classes than you think you can do and over deliver on those classes. I heard this story on the, um, the Cal Newport, Cal Newport podcast. And, and he, he was talking about this student who is one of those, um, uh, over achiever eyes bigger than their, you know, stomach type of students. And, and every semester they would, you know, sign up for this club and sign up for all these classes and, and have a job and do, um, the extracurricular activities. And, and they were always just grinding and not getting enough sleep and, and doing too much work. And, and, um, and the student, uh, applied for a uh, uh, education abroad type of thing, went to Australia. Uh, when he got there, they, uh, for whatever reason, whatever his visa was or whatnot, he couldn't get a job. He also couldn't do um, any of these sort of extracurricular sort of things that, that was normally on his plate. He couldn't be in any sort of clubs. He couldn't be in any of these uh, student leadership positions or whatever committees and things like that and so he's like all he had to do all he could do were the three classes he had signed up for <laughs> and so that's all he did was just focused on those three classes and what happened was these teachers were seeing all this amazing work that he was turning in for his assignments. And they're like, this is a really smart kid. This is a really good student. And it's just because he he, uh, you know, he put the time into it that the teachers sort of expected, right? And uh, and his work spoke for himself, essentially. His work uh, rose above what the other students were doing. Nobody looked at all the extra stuff that was going on. They just looked at what the work that, that, that he was delivering. And that uh, made him sort of become this, uh, this uh, spotlight of a student among the faculty for what he was done and, and it ended up, you know, helping him in his career and helping him in finding a job and whatnot. So it speaks to what, what you were saying, both of you were saying there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. A little case study. All right. Number three. All right. Number three got? is posting phantom artwork for the critique. And so this mean? is, this is, uh, you know, in, in most, um, in most illustration courses, you, you know, you start an assignment, and then you work up sketches and, th you know, thumbnails and then columns mm -hmm. and sketches. And you're showing your work to your teacher weeks before the critique, right? Mm -hmm. But posting phantom work is, as a teacher, I never saw any sketches. They never brought me any sketches. <laughs> no work. 
And then all of a sudden there's this piece that I've never seen before. And it always has tons of problems because we didn't work on it together, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And there was no, I mean, like the teacher is the art director, right? Mm -hmm. And and you need that feedback. You're paying for that feedback, right? And it's very rare that I've ever had a student that could handle work um, on their own. I have had some, especially those who um, came from animation Mm-hmm. And I've talked about that before. They had an animation career, decided to go back to school, came to school to be able to get their degree so they could go on and get a master's and then teach. And those guys could handle it. But even they didn't. They would post sketches. They were professional. They were ready to go, right? But yeah. it's the it's the student who... Do you think that's a kind of an ego problem where what they're really doing there is wanting to come in and just kind of blow you away like you didn't see any of this and here's something awesome for you i think there can be some of that in fact i was guilty of doing that in school i think most likely though they didn't get going on it until a few days before class Mm -hmm. and so they just and usually they're terrible so most of the time they're not they're not good so you know and, and you could take these with a grain of salt and say if you're an amazing student and you know what you're doing and you could show up and just post a phantom piece of artwork and get an A, then that's great. But then I would ask, well, why are you in school then? That's you know exactly what I mean? Like, what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, and, 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 you know, and I didn't want to hunt down my students and say, you know, I'm going to give you a, 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 you know, a thumbnail grade and a comp grade and a sketch grade and then a final grade, which some teachers do. And, you know, I, I feel like it's micromanaging. I, I like giving people a length of rope and letting them hang themselves. You know what I mean? Like, like oh, but the, the, to play devil's advocate there is they're in the process of learning the process. Right. Which mm-hmm. I would explain to them. And, and I would go through this whole thing. In fact, I went through these sins with my students on the first day of class. This was one of the <laughs> things I, in the last four years of teaching that I started doing. I was like, mm-hmm. you guys want to know what everybody did before you when they screwed up? And they're like, oh, they're all eager. Yeah, tell us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. And this is these are the behaviors. And I said, and I'll say, some of you in here are going to do these. And I'm not going to like guilt you or try to shame you or make you feel bad. No, just, not I'm us, just, Mr. Terry. I'm just, yeah, I'm just giving you. And, you know, and I say, I know that life happens sometimes where you know, you might have a death in the family or something and you run out of time and that's all you can do is post a phantom piece of art. I'm just saying yeah, in but the, general, the good student, the, the good students who have something like that happen, come to you and say, Hey, right. I've had a death in the family and this is what I'm going to do. And then you come up with a plan. Right. So and I would even say that in class. Sometimes I say, you know, um, Margaret here, we haven't seen this, her, any of her work before, but she had some um, personal things to attend to. And, this is what we're dealing with. So we're seeing it for the first time. Cause you know, a lot of the students, they would, we would share and look at each other's sketches. So everybody kind of knew what everybody's working on, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So I would help them with their excuse if they had a good excuse. Yeah. So anyway. Okay. So number, number five, four, number four, four. Uh, in classes where you have a sketchbook assignment, in other words, you have a sketchbook that you have to do for a grade, which a lot of illustration classes have. I don't know if you guys ever had those assignments with your classes, but we had a um, uh, in 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 two of my classes we had a um, an amount of sketches. They the students mm-hmm. had to do two hundred sketches throughout the semester, and they had to number them. And again, and so the sin sin number four is scribbling in the sketchbook to get points. Mm-hmm. Right. So I would tell them, you know, like, and this was kind of from our department, which was they wanted 200 sketches that took a half an hour each. Right. So it's 100 hours of yeah. sketchbook work throughout the semester. So it's something that you have to keep up on. You can't let it get to the end and then just do it I, again. And I could show you guys, I kept pictures. I would take pictures of sketchbooks, both good and bad. And mm-hmm. I would share, share them in the first day of class. This was part of the that first day of class thing. I would say, do you guys want to see what the people before you did in their sketchbooks? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. So here's what a good sketchbook looks like. And there, and you could tell, I'm like, you know, and I would ask my students, what can you tell about this person? They love drawing. Yeah. They love <laughs> designing flowers. They love um, 
they love um, designing in general. They love, you know, okay. So they have a passion for doing this thing. Okay, here's the bad ones. And they're like, they're literally like two minute, one minute scribbles. Yeah. And there's nothing good there. Not like, I mean, like you can do a gesture drawing in a minute that are good. And specifically, it's like these, the sketchbook isn't for gestures. That's not what we're doing here. These it, are finished the sketchbook sketches. sketchbook is, is your, is reps. Yeah, like it really is. You, you, essentially, the assignment is I want you to go to the gym and, and bench press uh, 100 pounds 30 times, three sets yeah. of 10 every day. Yeah. And then and at the end of the semester, the you could see who's got big pecs and who doesn't. Right. And then you've seen, if you've gone to the gym, you've seen people that talk more than they work out, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so that's what this is. They're, they're, so my thing is, if you're paying for an education, right? And you're given yeah. an assignment, you're given that assignment for a reason. Like, who cares about the grade? Like, I, I, did, not, I did not ever care about my grades in college. I got the grade that that I got, but I was passionate about drawing. And I would, I would even tell my students, I'm like, look, if you don't, if you hate doing the sketchbook assignment, the illustration career is probably not for you. It's probably really a positive thing that you're finding out that you hate doing the sketchbook and that you should pick a different major. You know, this is mm -hmm. actually good news. Finding out what you don't want to do is just as important as finding out what you do want to do. So if you don't, if you're just scribbling in your book to get those 200 sketches number one i'm not giving you credit mm -hmm. how right. miserable would it be to do to fill a sketchbook that way right miserable mm -hmm. right <laughs> but they did and every semester i would get three to five out of the 20 students three to five scribbles and three to five amazing sketchbooks and then everything in between kind of you know like they'd start out nice and then they'd get tired towards the end of the semester and they so i could give them some credit you know um but yeah, like just and that scribbling in a sketchbook or, or, or just, you know, phoning in your assignment, you're not learning anything. All you're doing is paying a lot of money to be able to turn in a piece of crap that's not going to that didn't make you feel good. You didn't really learn anything from it. And so it doesn't help you to do that kind of work. And I, I would I would tell my students, like, look, I'd rather you not turn in a sketchbook and focus all your time on your assignments mm -hmm. and take a hit on the sketchbook grade because you'll learn more than doing everything poorly. Like mm -hmm. spend right. some time really doing some stuff really well and then don't do some assignments. And that's now, one uh, thing I did. Now in let me play, like. play devil's advocate here because there's different kinds of students. And I'm just thinking of the person who really loves to like render something that takes forever and mm -hmm. they're just doing the finish. They enjoy the finish process. The sketch is just a, a precursory kind of thing if they do it at all. And then their real talent is in the finish and they spend a hundred hours there. Mm -hmm. What? Well, what there's some think? people that become texture painters, right? Um, for games and for animation. That, right. I guess there's um, no, no sketch for that. Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's still really good to be able to draw. And there are probably very few texture painters that can't draw, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. However, I do know one. <laughs> really? I'm not going to mention her name. Yeah. Worked for Pixar. And um, she can't draw. Couldn't draw. No. Nope. But can texture. She got in early. I doubt that she would get hired today. Mm. I hope she doesn't know who she, she is that I'm talking about her. I hope she's not listening to this, but it's, <laughs> it's the truth. Um truth hurts anyway well i i mean i wouldn't be i couldn't get hired today with the portfolio that i submitted to blue sky right in in 2005 you know <laughs> and i wouldn't have gotten any work with my graduating portfolio today. yeah, uh, the, yeah. The, the, the the students today or any of you guys that are doing um, illustration work and you know, you're trying to get prof, you know um you know professional illustration work you're probably further along than all of us were and I would imagine a big part of that is just having access to tons of great work. We had to wait every um, year for the for the illustration annual to come out in CA or for the um, you know Society of Illustrators annual. We had to, we we would pour over the same books and see the same images all year long, waiting for new ones. You know, you guys yeah. can go on Instagram every day and see new stuff, which is probably a double edged sword. Is probably 
<laughs> I think really it's used. made it's made a more homogenized kind of illustration look. Yeah. In a yeah. weird way, the pool is broad in a weird way, but then not that mm-hmm. deep. Yeah. I can see that. All right, number five is last to get set up in your painting class or drawing class or whatever class you you go in, you talk in, you're on your phone, and the teacher mm-hmm. sets up a model. Maybe it's a figure study class. Maybe it's a head painting class or something. Um, maybe it's a mediums class. And, you know, you, you come there with your little toolbox and you want to get your paints out and everything, but everyone is painting before you. And what I would tell my students is, you just don't like to paint. You don't, you don't enjoy this because, because the students that love it can't wait to get there, get set up and get working on their, their project. So being late, the last to set up and get ready for your uh, class is you're just, you're just wasting all kinds of time to be able to learn. Yeah. It takes a while to get set up. I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, if you're painting, you can't just show up. Were you the last one to get set up, Lee? Dude, I was the first one to get set up, and I <laughs> stayed late. I, could, I was making up for lost time the whole time I was I in school. I can believe that. I was just like, I'm catching up. I have to catch up. I'm gonna. My whole goal was to be top three no matter what class I was in. Remember, I had to have an industrial, uh, uh, industrial design minor, and oh, I didn't have mm-hmm. any history in that, and I couldn't really draw that well. And so I had a lot to make up for, mm. so I was like obsessive sort of. You know, dive and I have a, a little bit of OCD, and when I get going, man, it's really hard for me to change gears. And so mm-hmm. I was all in. I was all in. All right, uh, number six: showing your teacher the same sketches from week to week with no changes. Mm. So, did you ever have that where uh, where your students they they didn't do any work for the past week, right? But they still show you the same sketch you saw the week before because they feel like if they talk to you, then, yep, you're going to like them more and you're not going to be disappointed in them. And really, yeah, they're just kind of they're just kind of making up babble to fill space. Yeah, just babble. And you're like, as a teacher, you're you're like, okay, this person didn't do anything for a week, but they somehow think that you don't know that. That would happen. (laughs) That would happen mainly in. Um, independent study classes. Did you, I don't know if, did you ever have independent study students? Uh -uh. Okay. So I did. So I I would take on like five independent study students and they had to apply for that pitch something. And then I had to approve them to even get into that little program. So it was only four or five kids and, uh, they would come, it was just a, like, just like it sounds independent study. They pitch it. And then I meet with them every week. And Mm. that was exactly what would happen on those typically because like you were saying earlier they're they're really enthusiastic right in the beginning and then life sets in and they now there's and i'm not harping on them of what what they're going to do week to week i'm just saying you know if they come the more they come to me with the more we organize and plan because i've got something to bounce off of but they yeah they that would happen all the time and it's super annoying because to hear the little dance that they're doing and then seeing the ske- sketch be the same. Uh-huh. Like, mm-hmm. no, You're just wasting no. your time and wasting everybody else's time. Yeah. That's one of the things with digital work, though, now is that it's harder to do that kind of stuff. Because what I would do is they'd, they'd have to make a PDF for me so I could keep it and look at it and see progress and stuff like that. And so, you know, they show the new PDF and I just pull up the last week's PDF and then I just look at them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, you know, there's not, not many places you can go when it's the same thing, you know. Right. Embarrassing. I would be so embarrassed to to do that. Yeah, me too. (laughs) All right, number seven, never participating in critiques. So you have some students that they want their piece critiqued, Mm. but they never help critique anybody else's. Yeah. That's, that's pretty, an interesting one. There's two sides of that one. There's this, there's also the student who doesn't do any work and then they critique everyone's piece. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if that goes along with it. That's a that's good one. A, that's seven B. <laughs> yeah. Seven B. Seven, seven don't B. turn in anything, but you're highly oh. critical of everybody else. Dude, you think, you think by the way they're talking that they are the best artist in the room by far. And then you get to their piece. And it's like, Oh, you didn't do it. Or it's, or it's just <laughs> the most basic thing. You know? But don't you feel like it's selfish for a student to expect to get their piece critiqued, but they don't help 
critique someone else's. I mean, if it's a if it's a group critique sort of session type of yeah. thing, a lot of times yeah. though, you might not know enough about art to feel like you have uh, you can give a critique. You have authority yeah. to give point. a critique. And, and there's also some cultural things too, depending on where you come from. Like my wife's Japanese, and she would never be the person who is outspoken talking about people's work and how to fix it. Right. Never happened in a million. She's years. so fun. She's like always smiling and like if she's got a problem with you she's like hey so anyway yeah Will, she's very dumb um, i mean you don't just call people I, out and yet you don't <laughs> want to be the center of attention and that's i mean then you know i hate to put a broad generalized thing on on a whole society but it's just part of a culture like you don't want to be the guy ye- yelling and saying me look at me look at me i'm the best you know it just doesn't happen mm-hmm. in their culture as much i know there's probably some exceptions to the rule but as a whole. So I don't know. I, 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 I I'm going to. So should take I take that one out? Should I get, I have, I have an extra one just in case you guys didn't like it. Well, I think you should switch it to the person who doesn't do any work, but critiques everybody's because that is an annoying thing. Okay. So in the show notes, switch that one out, Daniel or Lily. <laughs> no, you can talk about it. Don't switch it out. <laughs> Let's keep it all in there. Let's keep it all in there. People can decide what they are. You know? All right. Here's number eight. Uh, the person who's always wearing headphones in class, even through the lectures all the time, headphone guy, headphone gal. The earbuds. Yeah. And the problem with that is like you said, Lee, you learn more from your students or from your peers than you did from the teachers. That's so true. Like I find that um, the students trust each other. Like there's more peer pressure, right? So like if like like when I was going to school, I was waffling between cho- declaring uh, illustration or graphic design as my major, mm-hmm. and you know a couple students were talking. I overheard them, and they're like, "Yeah, well, I heard that the money flows to the graphic design uh, firm first, and then they hire illustrators. So the graphic designers are upstream of all the money. So you have more job security if you go into graphic design." They were like, "Yeah, that's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm doing it." I'm going, am I dumb for wanting to go into illustration? And then yes. I, you know, and then I heard, <laughs> then I heard, heard some other students talking about illustration and they were like, um, I, I love making art. You know, their, their whole thing was, I got to do what I love to do. I got to follow my dream. If I'm mm-hmm. going to go this far, I'm going to go all the way. I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's me. You know, I got to go all the way. I got to do exactly what I want. I don't want to do graphic design. So you miss out on those if you're wearing your headphones all the time. If you're the loner student that's got the hoodie on, the headphones, the head down, drawing, you know, and I would have these kids come in and I'm like, you're you're cutting yourself out of so much opportunity, you know, Mm -hmm. they never know what's going on. Uh, well, it's interesting because a lot of people want to go to art school. They apply to the art school. They pay the money to go to art school. And then th- what you're kind of saying for a lot of these is they act like they'd w- rather be anywhere else but the art school. Right. <laughs> I get it. So, you're emo. Know. You know, you, you got a persona to uh, to satisfy. And, and you know, this you got to have your, your, your street cred or whatever. But at least turn them off so you can still hear what's going on. Pretend that you're not listening or something, but listen in on everything. Yeah. It's just understanding that the, the art class, uh, unless it's, you know, a a time period specifically designated for, um, studying or for Mm -hmm. working. Cause I would do that where we'd have lecture time and then it'd be my meet with them individual time. And everybody kind of worked on, um, you know, uh, it's a community. It's it's you're you're a member of a community. There's responsibility. You have responsibility to contribute, mm-hmm. and that completely says no. Headphones are great for the library, maybe not for the classroom. Right. It's it's interesting because you know there's some tendencies of good students and tendencies of bad students, and that's what, kind of what we're talking about here. Um, I'll give you two two quick stories. There was this guy in in my classes right before I left the art institute. It was his name was Manuel. He was amazing. I hope he's listening because he was he was fantastic, and he did good in all my classes. And I remember he was sitting next to somebody who was one of the 
lower tier students in the class. And I was meeting with that student. And so, you know, I would give the, the, the main assignment, everybody be working on a class assignment and I would go seat to seat and look at what they did for homework and talk about it and critique it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm next to him and with the student who's very, very below par. And he was listening. I could tell he was trying to pretend like he was doing the classwork, but he was just intent on listening to what I was saying, even to the worst student in the class. And I just noticed that about him. Anytime I'm giving feedback, he wanted to hear it. He absorbed mm. it mm. and he could put it to work. He, he would hear what I'd say to somebody else about some other piece. And he would say, oh, that's how that applies to my piece. And that is a skill to hear something and just about somebody else's work and say, oh, that applies to me in this way. Mm-hmm. Um, not everybody has that skill. They need to hear it about their specific piece. Um, so that was one thing I noticed about really good students. And then to what Will saying about the headphones and all that stuff, I had an art director come in from a game company in Seattle to my pre-production class. And th- this was a senior level class. And this guy was saying, not only are we close to you guys up in Seattle, but we are hiring and we want to hire you. And here's what we want specifically. And so he's giving this particular lecture. And it was, it was fantastic to, for somebody to preface a lecture like that. I want to hire you. Here's what it's going to be. Mm. And in the middle of his lecture, I hear the mouse, somebody's mouse clicking. And I was like, mm. there's no reason for somebody's mouse to be clicking. And so all of a sudden, uh, my radar goes up. And I'm just like, who <laughs> is who is not paying attention to this person? Uh-huh. <laughs> and um, and I slowly start to, you know, pan around. And, I'm, and I hone in on this kid in the back. And I go over to the side. And sure enough, he's just surfing social media. Yeah. And I was just like, <laughs> oh, you have to be kidding me. I exploded. I don't get mad that often. But I was, I just thought it was so disrespectful to hear that clicking mouse while this guy's giving this lecture, man, yeah. Yeah. opportunity lost. I mean, it's opportunity lost right. over and over for people who don't, they can't even hear the opportunity. They don't even acknowledge that it is there. And so yeah, you really got to pay attention. not getting hired. <laughs> 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 no doubt about that. But the worst part is I thought is, is he could distract somebody else, uh, away from hearing something or something, you right. know what I mean? And so, yeah. yeah. I got to say the thing you said before that is probably the most for for me probably the most important thing for this whole lecture or this this whole podcast is what you said about learning from uh other people's critiques. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm su- so surprised at how many students would completely zone out when their piece wasn't being critiqued like it didn't apply to them. And like we say that all the time on our um in our SVS classes like like when we're talking, like like in Children's Book Pro, we talk about other people's art and we're like, this will apply to you mm-hmm. just because we're not talking about your piece of work right now. The lessons that you can glean from this are every bit as important. And I'm always surprised at how many people, like you'll go through and you'll critique five people and you'll say basically the same thing on all five. Mm-hmm. And then you get to the sixth per- person and it's like they haven't been paying attention at all. They have no idea you're going to say the same thing about theirs. Yet it's glaring <laughs> right there, you know? Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill, I mean, to, to be able yeah. to hear and see a critique um, and, and yeah. understand what it's really talking about. It's tough. Yep. All right. Uh, we're getting down to the bottom of the list here. We're on number nine here. And nine is boring, but it's the people that are on their phone in class all the time. Kind of like what you were saying on the surfing the internet mm-hmm. i see i've seen people uh, playing games surfing the internet whatever on facebook uh, and it's like you know i mean like i get it like i've probably been guilty it's, of that too you right know, but i'm it, looking it, at pinterest right now uh, while you're talking uh, and i'm not talking i'm not talking about the person who's doing it occasionally when they are on top of everything and they have a little free time, they feel like they can afford it and they can budget it. I'm talking about the people that are chronic. You know, these, these this, sins are uh, more now, for now what if, let me ask you this. What if somebody's sort of doodling while you're talking? I don't mind that. Cause I have to, I doodle to listen. Mm-hmm. Like when right. I, when I was going to say that that's been yeah. proven to actually increase yeah. comprehension. No, no, no I don't be- need all eyes up here. I just, you know, you could tell who's, who's soaking it in and who's not, you know, Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the phone thing is, it's, I mean, it's, it's, 
I hate it when like we're watching a movie with the kids or whatever, and then they're on their phone, <laughs> and I'm like, right. "Can you look up at the screen?" For I think, I think they, I think people, not just kids. I don't want to be like, "Oh, these kids nowadays," but I think people, just in general, have lost it the is. ability to to hold focus that long. One one thing that I've noticed that uh, that adults do that are people that are my age, they have chronic information desire. And so like they'll see mm. some some actor pop into a movie and they'll be like, "What were they in?" And all of a sudden they're yeah. googling the it stops. in the middle of the movie. Oh my yeah. god, right. I can't stand it. I cannot stand it. <laughs> like just don't watch the do movie. <laughs> yeah, don't do it during the Please. movie. We don't need to know that they were in The Sixth Sense right. or some <laughs> other thing. <laughs> right. Uh, technology oh, a has been a, bit, a big problem. I was going to ask you guys a little bit of a non sequitur, but about technology. If you're if you're teaching now or you're a student in the classroom, are you are you allowing AI? And if so, to what capacity for mm. a learning or beginner student? Yeah. Oh, well, and then a follow up question to that was, can you detect it? How would you know? Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. if a student's using AI and then they're drawing from it. So they're not necessarily tracing it, not using the render, but using the, the composition. That's that is a good that is a good question. Would you would you be able to to spot it? I, I imagine if uh, you've got a, a D level student one week and then they're turning in A level work <laughs> a week later, something a sign. <laughs> something's going on there. <laughs> I used to assign copy assignments where I'd give an assignment that had to be copied and, it, and I required it to be a certain level of finish to even turn it in. I wasn't going to mm -hmm. give somebody, I wouldn't take like D level work uh, for a copy assignment. So I'd give mm -hmm. them a, like a background from a Disney film or something like that. And I used to hide little things at the pixel level. I would hide little symbols. And then when people would turn them in, sometimes I'd, I would, uh, because I would get that jump, like the D-level student all of a sudden turned in an absolutely perfect copy uh -huh. of a background, and then I'd zoom in and find my digital landmarks. <laughs> be like, all right, but now, how did you do that? You you gave them like a file? I gave them from... the file, oh. and uh, and then they would basically turn in my own file back to me with some little bit of paint on top of it oh, in, in spots, but it would still have my digital kind of signature that I added to the piece. And so I caught it. I mean, I've probably 10 or 15 people cheating like that. Wow. Nice try. Nice try. Like all of a sudden Did you're you just leave? a pro painter over one, one week. You're I just could, the, I could cheat in your class and get away with it. You would never be able to get away, I'd get with, away it. with it. No, 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 no. Well, I think, I think what, Jake, what would I get away with it? What students don't realize no, I don't know. is how many <laughs> images pros have seen. To be able That's to true. see a pattern of how you work. I can see from like Will was saying, week to week, all of a sudden if there's a giant jump, either you had some kind of epiphany and talent just kind of and, and skill just shined down on you, or something happened. Either your process changed or you're cheating. And mm -hmm. and um, you know, I get it. People want to get to the finish quick with AI. Now you can get to the finish quick. It's a big can of worms, I would think, for the educational process. Yeah. Um, and one that could easily be, if you over abuse it early, tough to get out of that being your only way of working. Well, and and that that is maybe an inherent problem with our society moving forward. So like it used to be one time you couldn't, you know, teachers would be like, you cannot use a calculator. You know, no calculators. <laughs> well, right. now you've got a calculator in your pocket, twenty four seven, right? right? And and so teachers are just like, okay, you can use the calculator, but you know, the the key thing is, can you solve this algebraic equation or whatever? Right. You know, and so it's like they've they've sort of succumbed to that bit of technology being a part of it. It used to be that you had to memorize facts for tests, right. you know, uh, dates, um, the, the order of the presidents, you know, the, where every capital of every state is. I don't know that they do that anymore because it's all, uh, Googleable. It's Alexa. Hey, what's the capital of, of, right. of, of Texas, right? Um, when they make them leave their phones at the door kind of a thing. Or put well, the, the, the thing is, is, is if that sort of knowledge is available to everybody, at a, at a drop of a hat, at a split second, what is the real valuable valuable thing 
that a person can bring to any sort of situation. It's right. their creativity. It's right. so their, if you're so if you're teaching an illustration class, do you allow AI or not? And if so, do you do you want to see the AI or do you want them to well, just hide it in the background? What do we what do we always say? And I'm just going to play devil's advocate here, but what do we always say um, to critique arena people or any type we give critiques? The idea. You know the 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 punchline the story is, yeah the story is more important than the illustration yeah okay so if if the actual rendering part isn't that important then why can't you tell a, a computer to say here's my story here's my idea go render it for me right good point I guess it would have to be consistent because what if the computer, if, if you're using AI, say you're using MidJourney and one week, you just happen to give it the right prompts with the right words mm-hmm. and the right whatever. And and then the next week you don't, was it just a lucky week on the computer? It's kind of a weird thing. Well, that's, that's assuming that it's uh mid journey is luck. Like I, I am if you know what you're doing on it, you can get consistent results. Mm. I would imagine you know. stu- uh, teachers today would be requiring their students to show work in progress more. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why I'm recording my videos now and posting them on Instagram of me painting these things that I'm posting. Because somebody asked you this: What if you, um, what if you finish reading a book and you're like, "Dang, that was a good story. I love it." And you go in and you're like, "You're telling everybody, I want I, you guys should read this book. It's amazing." Mm-hmm. What if you then found out that it was written by AI. I'd be a little you... sad. <laughs> I know that. I don't know how else I'd feel. I'd be a little sad. Would you, wouldn't you be a little bit bummed out yeah. about that? Yeah. I'm just, why, I'm though. just throwing out these. I, no, it's so, interesting because I don't know why I would be sad about that, but it would make me a little bit sad. I mean, it, it, I, I heard, I don't want to dive into AI cause it's, it's such a giant thing, but I heard somebody say the other day that now we've gotten, we thought that AI was going to replace all the drudgery jobs so we mm-hmm. can be creative, but it's done right. the opposite. It's created the creative stuff while we do the drudgery. Yeah. It's like, I, uh, you know, I am eating uh, a carrot today that was handpicked by a migrant worker, by a human. <laughs> and right. I'm looking at art that was created by a computer. Let's, let's flip that. Let's have me looking at art that was made by a human and me eating a carrot that was picked by a robot. I would I think that's that's where we need to go. <laughs> now the the other thing though is does it like what if uh AI solves cancer? You know, every single cancer is solved. AI figured it out. We know exactly. We've looked at all of this information that you fed us and boom, we know how to keep every single cancer patient alive. That's I would say the doctor has to say that AI did it every time they walk in the room. (laughs) Just to fess up. Would we would we be upset that that doctors are out of cancer doctors are out of a job? You know? Well they become illustrators. That that's true. Then they become really good questions. (laughs) Anyway, sorry. I did I I I steamrolled over you, Lee. You you were saying that That something about you you're making art. You're making sketches or something, whatever. Well, Who I, knows? I can't remember. Whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, sh- 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 did we sort of cover everything we want to cover here about? Doesn't we'll have like one or two school? more things? Yeah. Oh, I thought you got to ten. No, we're we're it's on just, nine. It just seems like that. Nine's oh, the phone. It's <laughs> taking forever. Let me go get for through it. this stuff. Yeah, All we right. didn't know Will was gonna steamroll our whole thing. All right, ten. Overly <laughs> critical of pro illustrators' work. You ever seen students that mm. are, they hate everything? They're like, you bring up a, a pro that's just amazing, mm-hmm. and you're a student, and they go, "Oh, that guy, his work is trash, or her work is trash." The, right. the ten deadly and, student sins, and, and a, they're incapable. A teen, right. Late teen thing to say. I mean, that's like right. you bring up any band, and they're like, "Oh, I liked them before they sold out." Yeah. You know? <laughs> so take it for what it is, but it's like someone trying to elevate themselves by pushing someone else down, right? It's good. It's that's my whole technique. It's amateur. <laughs> that's a sign of amateurity. Um, I have a bonus one here. Eleven. All right. I knew it. They Golly. pack up early in their media class or their drawing class or their. Mm. They pack up way early. They're they're ready and packed up ten minutes before class is over. 
again, why are you here? You don't like doing this. You should pick another major. You should do something else. Now, I also have four things that students should do. No, no, no. You got to give it over to Jake. I asked a question in the beginning. Then you asked all, then you listed the hundred things. You got to get these in. These are valuable. I don't, students- honestly, I don't have anything, so this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> you should have said that part. You should have said, go ahead. I'm just well, taking I'm over. Gonna... <laughs> okay, taking well, over. go ahead. All right. The first one is give yourself assignments. Just because you're in school and just because you're given assignments doesn't mean you can give yourself, you can't give yourself even more assignments that will take you towards your goal of the market that you're trying to get into. Just don't wait for school to be to come to you. Often the teachers are going to give you assignments that you don't like. So in between, you know, in on Thanksgiving break, at spring break, in the summer, whenever, even during school, if you can muster the time, give yourself the kind of assignments that you wish you could do. Mm-hmm. And that'll blow your classmates away. I used to do that. And my classmates would be like, what's that for? Like they were missing something, you know? And I'm like, oh, I'm just doing that. And they'd be like, you're just doing extra work? Yeah, I love this. This is going to be my career. This is what I want to do. I love doing this. So I can't do enough. And I want to get better. So I'm doing more. So that's one. Good one. Um, Okay. I like it. Two, redo your assignments before the deadline. So you're working on your assignment. It's not turning turning out. You don't have to turn in the assignment that's not working out, you can actually crumple it up and start over. Mm-hmm. And you should do that, right? Well, Have that's, the, that's the mark of a pro. I just want to, I just yeah. want to throw that. That's the biggest difference between professionals and amateurs. In my opinion is they have no problem starting over. Yeah. So many students put the, put up their work and they're like, it just didn't turn out. And they, and they, it didn't turn out days ago. Right. And they had time that they could have started over, you know, so there. Well, that leads to not doing it at the last minute because then you ruin that opportunity like you're talking about. Good point. Yeah. Um, Some of my best students (coughs) over the years have had side hustle illustration gigs like, um, you know, shout out to Rachel. Um, She was working on comics and selling it uh, at uh, comic conventions while she was in school. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I've had a lot of students that have done that, that have had um, other illustration jobs, um, freelance work that they've been working on while they're in school. So you don't have to wait to get out of school before you start looking for work. You could be working while you're in school. Um, and the best students do. Um, so that's number three. Okay. And number four, I think you talk, talked about this, Lee. Um, a little bit, we touched on this, is learning about the market that you want to go in into while you're in school. So really, like, don't wait for a class assignment for you to, um, you know, learn about the market that you want to go into or the, or the kind of work that you want to do. Start doing your research because when once you get out of school, it's go time, right? And you don't want to start doing it then it's too late you need to know what you're going to do what your game plan is going to be you need to know about the markets that you're going to go into while you're in school so those the students that do those four things tend to really do well Um, let me let me add a fifth thing yeah you can well I'll, i'll say this we see a lot of times when people are trying to learn they're motivated which is awesome and they're dedicated which is awesome but then they go into this weird little moment where they're just doing foundations and everything looks like boxes and perspective exercises and all that stuff is great to learn. You have to go through those steps, of course, but don't just eat your broccoli. This should feel like this is a great career. It's really fun. It should yeah. feel like dessert. And so if it feels like broccoli, like, no, I'm just going to do my pushups over here and uh, I'm not having much fun, but this is, I got to do it. Your work's going to be stifled and it's going to be stiff. And the people that excel, in my opinion, are the ones that say, okay, I need to learn perspective. And I'm into, you know, uh, uh, zombie apocalypse kind of scenario. Okay, so how Mm -hmm. do I make a zombie apocalypse scenario using these perspective rules? And they get into it or make a children's book scene using these things that they're trying to learn. And it's those people that kind of combine the eating your broccoli with eating your dessert. It's the perfect little 
moment where you can be in foundations and still make beautiful, beautiful artwork um, that you love. It doesn't yeah. have to look like a foundations assignment. Yeah. <laughs> Will's making a mouse, mouse clicking mouse noise in his mouth. that mouse your, click. During your lecture. <laughs> 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 click, um, click, click. <laughs> broccoli is, uh, have you ever had the pizza with the broccoli on the top? No, that would, that's sacrilege. <laughs> No, okay, have you ever had the, not pizza. No, there's a, there's some good uh, pasta dishes that have broccoli in it too. So, so that's a way to have your broccoli and have something tasty. It'll never be dessert. It's got some it cheese. It'll never in be. There. It'll never be a donut. It's Parmesan on the top. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It will never be a donut. Um, okay, so. Will gave us the seven deadly or the 10, 11, 12, actually, because seven B. It seemed like <laughs> right. <laughs> His dad's uh, been d- dad's been yelling at us for like an hour, Jay. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, thank you for that, Will. Uh, I I think overall, though, um, the, the message here is your your art education doesn't happen to you; you happen to it. Like mm. you have to take charge of it, Good you know, quote. um, uh, it's, it, you have to take it into your hands and, and, and be in control of, of what you want, figuring out what you want and, and going towards that it, because I'll tell you this, your career is going to be the same way. Your career doesn't just happen to you. And I don't know anybody who's just got lucky doing this. Uh, they've had lucky, um, uh, breaks, but the luck came because they were in the right time, right place at the right spot, doing the right thing, you know? Um, so, and so your career is going to be something that you actually actively have to be working on, you know, setting goals, working towards those things. And you learn all that stuff in this educational phase of your life too. And I would say a lot of these deadly sins that you talked about, uh, uh, they, there's a, a career counterpart to them as well you know you could probably combine a few of them into one but it's taking it seriously you know not showing up late for conference calls you know a zoom meeting that you have with with uh with a client delivering on time you know being present um in in the meetings or or in the communication with them um all that stuff applies and if you don't learn it young you're going to learn it the hard way later absolutely yeah uh, should we, anything else you guys want to add to this? There's one more thing I want to add, and that okay. is a lot Your of 20 times, rules for... <laughs> <laughs> actually 30. It's hard to, to figure out what you're supposed to focus on. A lot of programs, the, the one benefit, I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast, but the one benefit of Art Center was we had two years of foundation, and then two years of them saying, you tell us what you're going to do, and you have to do it. A lot of programs will aren't, aren't that free, and the, the benefit of that was everybody ended up very with a very specific look to their work, very different mm-hmm. from the person next to them, and and it was a highly focused kind of school. But a lot of schools will give you classes all the way up until your senior year. Oh, you got to take two sculpture classes, three illustration classes, this and that. And by the time people get ready to graduate, they haven't even they've only dabbled in, they've had two illustration classes and they've had a sculpture class and an entertain one entertainment class. And so they're sort of like, Oh, I'm going to be, maybe I'll do visual development at Pixar or maybe I'll do a children's book and maybe, and then maybe I'll be a gallery artist on the side. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's just so unrealistic. You're, you're not going to take a visual development job from somebody who studied visual development only for years if you just have one or two classes in it. And so it's one of the big things that I think needs to be taught that isn't being taught in programs is that if you got to pick your focus and you got to go for it. I mean, I heard a lot of students say, oh, if my main career doesn't work out, I'll just do children's books. Like it's just a side thing that's free. You know what I mean? Like you just decide to do it and all of a sudden you're going to be, you think you're going to take a children's book from me or from Will? Not going to happen. So it's just, it's, and you might not even know that you're doing it because you're going through the program and you're taking your two illustration classes and you've had your three figure drawing classes. And it really is on you to pick where you're going to end up 
and build a specific portfolio for that. It's going to be more than two classes. It's going to be more than three classes. It needs to be your whole focus for the last at least year and a half of school into whatever, whether it's going to be, you're going to be a visual development artist. It needs to be only visual development for the last year and a half to get a portfolio that's workable. Otherwise, mm. you're going to have this dabbly kind of portfolio that touches on a few things, but isn't actually good at any of them. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. That's a good one to yeah. end on. Boom. My all right. I'll, I'll, take us, I'll take us out. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us on Three Part Perspective. It's made possible by SVS Learn. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts are Will Terry, Lee White, and I'm Jake Parker. You can find us at uh, on Instagram, on YouTube. Do a little search for Lee White. Do a little search for Jake Parker. Do a little search for Will Terry, and they'll will come up uh, wherever you wherever you look for us. We're there. Uh, special thanks to our podcast producer Daniel Two. You can find his work at daniel2.co. That's tu.co. Special thanks to our show notes wrangler Lily Howell, and uh, and our um, chief operational office officer. What do we call Lisa? Yeah, <laughs> Pro I don't know. Production <laughs> manager. <laughs> the brains. I forgot. I'm not going off my notes today. Uh, special thanks to Lisa Fott for for her work as well. Um, and Austin Shirtliff as our curriculum coordinator over at svslearn.com. Um, I think that's it for today. Uh, we just want to say thank you for everybody who does listen to this podcast. And if you are still listening at this point, put a ruler emoji at the end of it for the for the rules of uh, Will Terry's 10 rules of uh, being a good student or being a bad student, whatever. Ruler emoji. <laughs> the sins. Yeah. Yes. There you go. That's it. Hey, now go draw go something. Draw some. You know, whenever you say, uh, I'm going to take you out, I'll take us out. Yeah. I always think, I get a little excited like we're going to go out and get something to eat. <laughs> okay. Get your shoes on. We're going to go to the ice cream. Go take us out. <laughs> Is that what your dad yeah. used to say? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dad. Nobody, nobody ever takes me out for ice cream, man. I'd love that. Oh. <laughs> Poor Lee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to end it here.